welcome back. I'm Cindy Meyerson. I'm your co-host here for Unlocking the Vault with our host, Dan Lindstedt. Tonight, we're going to talk about agile methodology. What do we really mean in Data Vault when we consider agile methodology? And what does it mean? We hear people talk about big A agile versus little A agile. And so where does that leave us? Let's start out by clarifying what I'm going to say is a common industry misunderstanding that somehow a data warehouse project does not perhaps require let's just say process of some kind. From our perspective, when you build an enterprise analytics solution, you are building software, at least in principle. Now, Dan, I know you've had a lot of experience with this, a lot of background in it, and probably a rather strong opinion on this. Why don't you talk a little bit about this with regard to data warehouses really in principle being like a software development project? Absolutely. Thanks. And for those of you that don't know, I've got about 35 plus years in the IT industry and been building data warehouses for most of it. So from that perspective, we talk about building a data warehouse. The first thing that comes to mind or doesn't come to mind is, hey, I'm building software. And, and in, that can take many forms. Some people say, I'm not building software because I'm using software. Other people say, I'm not building software because it's, it's a data warehouse. What exactly does that mean? a data warehouse. Change the words data warehouse. If you don't like it, call it an analytic solution. I really don't care. We, you call it a zebra with brown stripes. It doesn't matter. But the point is, if you look at the software principles and the best practices that have been built over the years, way before my time, when software first started in the 50s and 60s, or probably I think software started early 50s or before that, but now I'm dating myself. A lot of time has passed and there's a great possibility for all of these processes to, to really be matured is what I wanted to say. So you've got a big maturity in the software build lifecycle. So when we say we stand on the shoulders of giants with the data vault methodology, we really do. When you build a data warehouse, first off, I've said this in the last podcast and I'm gonna, you're gonna hear this more from me as we go along. Building enterprise analytics solutions is not easy. When you're focused on the enterprise, there's a lot to consider. And like I said before, when you're building enterprise data warehouses, I don't care, change the title. It's not easy. And a lot of people like to say, it is easy, just do this. That's not how this works. So why shouldn't we follow all the same principles that have been tried, tested, and proven to work when you're building software? And of course, apply agile to it. And if you're going to say we do agile, but we don't build software, then you've got another thing coming because it in fact says in the Agile Manifesto, it uses the word software. And what I'm referring to when you build a data warehouse, you've heard this many times, is all of the principles around building software apply, like good governance, building master data, building process controls, adding versioning and version control, delivery lifecycle management, error correction, estimations versus actuals in the ways we build, in-person effort to accomplish things and making sure the run rates are good and the quality is good and Six Sigma is applied. And we have release cycles and rollback cycles. And we have a number of, to use a term from the 70s, function points, right? How do we count and the amount of work that's done and, and that kind of thing. All of this stuff really is at least in my opinion, or my strong opinion, you are in fact building software and you have all the principles that should be applied when you build when you build an enterprise data warehouse to your entire process, your architectures, your designs, your releases, your moving data, even if you're leveraging automation software to help you with the task. Those tools in the automation space, they're really there to accelerate what you do. And again, if you stick to the standards. And if you missed our last podcast on the standards, we highly recommend you go back and take a listen to it. But before we go any further, let's start with some definitions because I'm not so sure that all of our listeners actually understand what big A agile versus little a agile really means. And I apologize to those of you that know this, you can skip ahead for a few minutes, but we're gonna read some definitions here just to put everybody on the same page. And when we started the podcast, we talked about the importance of terminology. And this is something that we bake into the practitioner class on CDVP2. We talk about terminology and how important it is 
for teams that want to be agile to speak the same language. You can't be agile and speak different languages. It doesn't work because you need the team to be a cohesive unit. So by that, we're going to talk about definitions now. So I'm going to read, big A agile is a noun relating to or denoting a method of project management used especially for software development, there we go again, that is characterized by the division of tasks into short phases of work and frequent reassessment and adaptation of plans. We don't have a, a source uh, quote for that, so we can't tell you where we got it, but it is not ours. And then the next thing I want to read here is what is the difference between big A Agile and little a Agile? Big A Agile is branded and process focused, while little a Agile is collaborative and outcome focused. And then we've skipped a bit down to another sentence in this, in this reference. The implications of one over the other is that big A Agile tends to introduce process-driven brittleness and a focus on big changes versus incremental changes. And that reference is from what is Agile, big A or little a Agile, posted by T-C-A-G-L-E-Y, T. Cagley under Agile, tags and Agile, big A, formal, little a, Tobias Meyer. Then we have another set of quotes we're going to read in Bear with me. We're almost done reading. <laughs> so some more definitions here. Thought leadership articles go on to talk about this. Stop confusing little a agile with big A agile. The velocity of change is continuing to increase as organizations experience bigger, faster, and more complex, along with more cross-functional change. Both uppercase A agile and lowercase a agile aim to equip organizations to more effectively respond, to seize and seize opportunity. Uppercase A Agile is a method of approaching a particular initiative that originated in software development but has extended into other types of change. Lowercase A Agile is trade, sorry, trait marked by the ability to change more effectively and less painfully. By understanding the difference, practitioners can increase clarity and alignment around these pressing topics. Now we're done reading, and now we're going to get back into some framework discussions around Agile, Scrum, and SAFE, and so on. Now that we understand what Big A Agile is versus Little A Agile, let's talk about the different Agile approaches. So there's something out there called SAFE, S-A-F-E, and that's capital S, capital A, capital F, lowercase e. It's called the Scaled Agile Framework, and it's used quite frequently in government work or in program-based work. Pure Scrum and Pure Agile are all in their own rights. And then, of course, there's something called Lean Initiatives, which is a granddaddy of a lot of Agile principles. And I'll dive a tad into this one in a minute. We have approaches like Disciplined Agile Delivery from Scott Ambler and Mark Lines, whom we work with, and we're happy to have their support in the data vault methodology sense. Discipline Agile Delivery, for those of you that don't know, is a hybrid of pure Scrum and pure Agile. And Scott, I'm sorry if I messed that up. We can get that corrected. And of course, Lean Initiatives. Now, Lean Initiatives, I snuck that one in there because if you do any reading on Lean Initiatives, that's where my background is. Lean Initiatives has led into many different disciplines, including continuous improvement, continuous delivery, and so on. So function point analysis was part of lean initiatives in the early days. So there's a lot to go on. There's a lot of lessons learned here, but there's a bunch of different approaches and the scaled out, excuse me, scaled agile framework is one that we're going to talk about here in, in just a minute. But in terms of the data vault, what did we choose with the data vault methodology and why did we choose discipline agile delivery? So we chose, as I just said, Disciplined Agile Delivery from Scott Ambler and Mark Lines, because it deals with the entire life cycle, inception through delivery and retirement. And it embeds DAD principles into the methodology, the, speci specifically around the ways of working. And we're going to get into some more details around that. The Scaled Agile Framework is just to change gears a little bit. The Scaled Agile Framework is more focused on program level. Now, I want to get back to this idea. What's underneath all this Agile talk is this thing called the Agile Manifesto. And in the Data Vault methodology, 
we back them with how-to prescriptive instructions. And I personally believe that many people misunderstand the Agile Manifesto principles. And one example of this is people and process over software, right? And when you look at that, they don't, the Agile Manifesto tends to lead you down the road of saying, we don't need software. We don't need requirements, but that's the wrong way to read the manifesto because the manifesto doesn't say don't use software. The manifesto doesn't say you don't need requirements, but for some reason, a lot of people go down that, that road. And we've been through that road before. Just think about extreme programming back in the early nineties or late eighties and where that ended up today. Now there's certain flavors of extreme programming that work in very narrow use cases or very narrow in innovative type of labs. But once you come with a result from an extreme programming innovation, then it's time to test it. Then it's time to productionalize it. Then it's time to see whether or not it will work in the bigger picture. And that's where some of the software engineering principles come back into play. Now, back to the Agile Manifesto, they say, I've heard this before, we don't do software, we build data warehouses. And of course, I'm going to ask you if you have a delivery timeline, do you have specific use cases or do you need to measure success? Do you need to track errors in production and rework and assign corrective actions? Do you have a backlog? Do you build automated data processing routines? Do you apply version control? Well, all of those things are part and parcel to software builds. And of course, yeah, we do use automation tools, but all of this stuff fits inside the Agile Manifesto and the principles with the Agile Manifesto and the Data Vault methodology wraps it all together. And we'll get into that a little bit later in this podcast. We'll talk about how the Data Vault methodology works with discipline Agile delivery. For now, we're going to talk a little bit about SAFE uh, and SAFE versus DAD or SAFE with DAD. Cindy has knowledge, a working knowledge of SAFE versus DAD. And I want to hear from Cindy's perspective on this because she's worked in government projects before where SAFE has actually been used. So Cindy, would you enlighten our listeners a little bit? Sure. Thanks, Dan. When we think about SAFE, as Dan said, it is generally extremely powerful at the program level. Where I've implemented data vaults inside the government, the concept of disciplined agile delivery fits inside the SAFE framework because SAFE doesn't really tell us exactly how to build anything. DAD is very helpful as a method to implement data vaults within a safe environment in order to achieve delivery in a prescribed, I would say a prescribed approach. So there's a number of agile frameworks that are available for large scale enterprise projects. SAFE is one of those, but the first step in choosing one is to fit your organization's needs is to understand and educate yourselves on what those different options are for you with regard to an agile approach. We look at a couple of popular large scale frameworks. Again, I said scaled agile is one and disciplined agile delivery on its own is also designed for larger scale projects too. But since the government has generally moved towards SAFE, and since it's a framework, we can actually fit other methods inside of it. So DAD really prepares you for DevOps. That's one of the things that's different about DAD from Scaled Agile. SAFE focuses on that, as Dan said, program level, the higher level operational processes. So it's good in specific circumstances. Discipline Agile Delivery, it actually addresses the inception, the thought process, if you will, about around the scope of a project, the construction, which is what most Agile approaches include, like Pure Scrum and things like that. Most of them will focus on construction phase, if you will. But say, but then again, DAD also includes the transition phase, which is really delivery and retirement, which is interesting. So if you're looking at data and building a, an analytic solution, data has a life cycle. It's got an inception, a creation, if you will, a construction phase, especially in a warehouse where you're taking raw data, moving it into a business outcome. And then we have to consider things like policy around data retention. And so the 
dad fits naturally when we think about that transition phase because we have to potentially retire the data. So to follow the full data life cycle, dad seems to fit, and that's one of the reasons we use it, it seems to fit much better, even if it's used as part of a safe program level framework. Thank you. That's very enlightening on SAFE. And one of the things I want to remind listeners is the difference between a methodology and a framework. We talked about this in a different podcast, so I'm not going to belabor the point, but a framework will tell you what you need. It won't tell you how to build it. And dad has some of those prescriptive techniques on how to do things. And then of course, we have the data vault methodology. So where does that leave us with the data vault methodology? How is dad different or relevant or part of the data vault methodology? Can we leverage safe on top of dad or on top of the data vault methodology? Do we need a data vault methodology? So lots and lots of questions I can hear you asking out there in the podcast land, but we're going to try to address some of these questions now. And we're going to start by saying agile does not simply just mean getting something done faster. And it, it doesn't mean that you can change your mind during a sprint on a whim without, of course, cost and consequences. And agile isn't something that IT or just IT does. Agile requires collaboration with the business. Now, for those of you that have been trained in Data Vault, you understand that Data Vault methodology includes people process and technology. And that being a methodology, we give you a prescriptive uh, set of instructions on how to build. And like we talked about in the last podcast, we give you a set of quote, best practices, which you can then adapt and change and leverage or choose not to use. And then we give you a set of standards that you must follow in order to achieve success. And they go together. They work together for the best possible outcomes. So the methodology includes the people, the process, and the technology, and requires collaboration with the business that we started out by talking about. And so now we're going to talk a little bit more about what Data Vault and Data Vault methodology bring to the table. So if we think about it, we do leverage DAD specifically, so discipline, agile, delivery. And in some ways, because we leverage dad with the permission of Scott Ambler himself, we tend to follow the same things that they do, right? So every data vault sprint, for example, in an agile context starts its life with a business concept and delivers outcomes according to the business perspective. And so this is where we go in, in terms of how do we get started? So we do, we do this with the DAD process and follow inception and design and all those other things in the Agile lifecycle. But we focus down in terms of being a methodology, the methodology gets down to the actual sprint level and says, how do you exercise this in a sprint level and how do you build it in a sprint level? Or how do you build a sprint on a prescriptive set of steps or process a set of steps? We call this the ways of working. Right. So the data vault methodology brings a definition of an extended taxonomy. This is one of the things that is absolutely unique to the data vault methodology, at least from my perspective. I've spent a lot of time listening to a lot of folks in the industry and data warehousing and business intelligence and never heard them talk about the need for an extended taxonomy. I learned about some of that when semantic web was a hot concept or a hot term and started developing the focus from a methodology perspective. And the extended taxonomy is basically a taxonomy of business terms or business concepts. And really what we want to do is take these business concepts and tie them directly to the business processes. It goes back to the CMM principles. You can't measure what you don't, what you don't define. And in the whole nature of the stack there right? You can't define what you don't understand. And I've, sh I've shrunk the stack down, but that's the whole construction of it. And so when we say tie business concepts to business processes, what are we really doing? Well, we have to then somehow understand what data does the business process use in order to accomplish its goals? 
what business concepts are wrapped up in the business processes. An example of a business process would be closing the books for financial accounting, right? So what data is involved in closing the books? How do you uniquely identify that data? Well, those are the business keys or the business terms. And then of course, you never want to boil the ocean when you're building a, so the data vault methodology says, look, if you start with an extended taxonomy, you take a, a set of business terms and the business keys and you build it into a hierarchy. So extended taxonomy simply means you've got a taxonomy that quote has been extended by additional things. And so we add things like business keys to the taxonomy. We add things like identification of the business concepts. We add things like identification of the business processes at a conceptual level, at a label level. We talk about which processes use this data. Well, the accounting process to close the books is a description that we would apply in an extended taxonomy. So it really brings all of this stuff together and identifies it. So once we identify it, we can define it. Once we define it, we can then put KPAs around it, and then we can put KPIs on it, and we can measure it, and we can design processes to get there. So it's the as is and the to be state of things, and this is what the methodology brings to the table. So it then ties these business terms to the actual business processes. Now, the kicker that the data vault methodology brings is that we manage the scope of a sprint through the use of the extended taxonomy and we leverage DAD to actually execute the sprints. And that would be the discipline agile delivery components. Now, in terms of managing the scope of the sprints, what does that really mean? I can hear your wheels turning and people saying an extended taxonomy. Are you talking about a business glossary? Yes, in a way, but being an extended taxonomy, it crosses both the boundaries of being a business glossary, as well as being a technical, a technical, as well as being a process identification mechanism. It has a lot of different components put together and it brings them all together in a central place. And then the next question is, that's huge. That would take me years to build. That's why we've never built one in our company. I get that. What I'm saying is you don't want to boil the ocean. You don't want to build an extended taxonomy for the whole business and never have any outcomes or never put anything into production. That would be the wrong way to do it. So take the principles of sprints and the principles of dad, small, meaningful chunks of work and identify that piece of the extended taxonomy when you're working on it. Build your enterprise extended taxonomy over time, over deliverables. And so that's what we do when we manage Sprint. What's the minimum viable product? Maximize the amount of work not done, right? And maximize the amount of work not done, which is an agile principle, and focus only on what you can do and what you need to do to deliver today, tomorrow, next week, two weeks from now. And with that whole principle, once we teach teams how to leverage this extended taxonomy and how to work with the data vault methodology, which talks about these components, we can get teams to actually execute quote unquote sprints in a day. And we've talked about that before and probably we'll talk about that again in, a, in another podcast in the future, but sprints in a day, right? It's an iteration in a day, complete from inception all the way to delivery, at least in development right? So we want to exclude the nature and notion of profiling and understanding your taxonomy and understanding your terms, but you really want to scope it down. So from that perspective, uh, uh, Cindy, you've done some work with building extended taxonomies. So would you maybe share with us a little bit about that process and what it means? Sure. Happy to do that. From my perspective, this, I thought this was one of the really, I would say pivotal things about data vault that really attracted me is generally when you walk into, you walk into an IT organization and they're starting to work on an analytic solution, the business tends to more often than not basically come in and tell the IT team or their analytic team, give me all the data, (laughs) which is always an interesting (laughs) challenge, right? When Dan says, don't boil the ocean. And for the business out there, one of the things you want to think about is rather than boiling the ocean, wouldn't you prefer to have meaningful, valuable outcomes coming out of the team in a more organic fashion. To do that, what the team is going to need to do is actually have, I would say, laser focus 
on a particular problem that gets solved, a particular outcome. And that outcome, maybe it's a business question you're trying to resolve. So if you take that idea of the outcome inside of a business question, there are specific business concepts at play. All right. And so if I look at an extended taxonomy as part of the disciplined agile and inception phase, if that extended taxonomy is built properly, it's focused on the concepts that are evident inside of the question to be answered or the outcome. And that's how I usually start. And so if I keep that, those concepts, those business concepts together inside of the sprint, then what I'm looking at on the extended taxonomy is just those business concepts broken down to specific key process areas that touch those concepts. Let's take the idea of a, of collecting a debt. All right. This is something that we talk about inside of our CDBB, our Certified Data Vault Practitioner course. This is an example we use, and it's a good one. All right. If I want to collect a debt, I need to understand which uh, pieces of the business that that process, that business process touches. So if I talk to the business and I build up an extended taxonomy from that, I'm looking at the finance department, perhaps, and inside of finance, I'm looking at a key process area called accounts receivable. And a sub process of that is debt collection. And so we start to talk to the business and build an extended taxonomy on this sort of hierarchy of functional business process, i.e. debt collection, and then the terms that the business uses. And so in this case, the business says, in order to collect a debt, I have to understand who the customer is that I'm trying to collect from. And I have to understand that there is probably an invoice involved. So I have these business terms, customer and invoice. So the extended taxonomy would, out, would identify the fact that I've got two business terms, customer and invoice, and those two business terms are going to be reflected in the business process by some, let's just call it data element, all right? So the idea or the concept of customer gets tied to its term in the business, and then it became, becomes a I will say, let's just say a pointer to a specific data element inside of the operational system, your finance system. And maybe customer is identified in the finance system through a technical element called account number, all right? Whereas an invoice perhaps is going to hold the, the account number and perhaps the product ID and the quantity and things like that. So my invoice is going to be also identified to that entire business process. So I have two business terms, customer and invoice. I have now the, in the extended taxonomy, I know which system contains both the customer and which system contains the invoice. So I've tied my terms, my business terms, to a business process, collect collection, and tied that business process and business term to the actual data elements that are used. If I scope my sprint to deliver the answer to the question, who owes me, whose debts are outstanding, whose invoices are outstanding, then I can focus the extended taxonomy down to these two business concepts. Now, what I really love about this is we know that the outcome is going to be a report that gives us the invoice and the customer and the amount owed, the collected amount that we're going after. So that's my outcome. And I can actually, because I've tied the components, the technical components required in the outcome back to the business term, the extended taxonomy not only allows me to keep the scope of what I'm delivering to just those concepts, but it also ties the concept, the business concept, the, the key process area to the outcome, which is your metrics, your key process indicators. And, it, and you're able to follow that through disciplined agile from inception, if you will, the conceptual part of building out the extended taxonomy 
all the way back out to delivery, that transition phase, which is the outcome, which is your metric. So I hope that makes sense. I'm trying to condense this a bit, but the idea is the extended taxonomy actually enables your team to maintain its focus on the outcome, which is how much money are we supposed to collect from any given customer at any moment in time? And it ties that outcome right back to the concept that is a business concept. Makes a lot of sense. And for those listeners out there, just a, a short recap, because I know we're at time here, but the data vault methodology prescribes how to deliver people, process, and technology. The discipline agile tells you what you need in terms of preparing your teams for delivery transition and the construction phase and all of that. So the different phases of people building and that kind of thing, teaming up, where the methodology actually gets into how do you measure, how do you scope, uh, how do you apply hindsight in retrospective and tying it back to not only the business concepts in a concrete fashion, but also tying it to the KPAs and KPIs so that you can either measure success. Hey, we did that right. This is the warehouse outcome. It applies directly to this business process. Or no, we missed the mark. We didn't deliver what we said we were going to, or we, we didn't even have this in the use case. We'd never seen this number before. So there's lots of different things that the methodology acts like glue to bring together the way you work with the actual build cycles and the implementation best practices. And that about wraps it up uh, for us. And I'm your host, Dan Listed, with my co-host. Cindy Meyerson. That's all for this time. Thank you. We hope you'll join us in the next podcast. Take care.